Hello and uh, welcome to the VFR webinar. Thank you so, so much for joining us. We really appreciate you having, um, having you here. And we know that a lot of you guys are joining us from around the world. So I know it's probably um, a little bit late there. So thank you so much for still taking that time uh, to jump on here. Uh, we know that these are very um, uncertain times and hard times. So we want to always offer these courses for you guys, um, making sure that you guys can still do continuing education and really freeing up your, your um, free time with, or I'm sorry, filling up your free time with these things and really getting to know your Viora device better. Um, so for those of you that are in the States, I know for around the world, you guys may, um, may have owned your VFR for quite some time. Uh, but for those of you guys, let me just uh, pop somebody's camera off really quick. There we go. Um, so for, for those of you guys that are joining us here from the States, uh, I just want to note that the VFR is still in IRB study. So if you guys are part of the IRB study, um, I also wanted to let you guys know that if you guys have not done a Skype with myself, um, uh, really with just the overall um, study requirements, going through the paperwork and what's required of you guys, I did create a tutorial video and going through all of the paperwork, the full study, how it's conducted. So if you guys have not seen that or have not done that Skype with me, um, now we have that tutorial video. You can get that uh, just by emailing us and that's clinicalusa at vioramed.com. So again, that's clinicalusa at vioramed.com. And that is just gonna be for the people that are in the United States um, and that are part of the IRB study. So the VFR is not yet FDA approved here in the States. Um, just wanted to note that just in case you guys are from the States and are not part of the study, but here just to learn. Um, so we're happy to have you guys. And once it is, um, once we go through that process of FDA approval, hopefully this year, um, then we are open to selling it here in the States. So very exciting. Um, I didn't introduce myself, I'm so sorry. Uh, my name is Kara Moncrief and I am the Clinical Communications Director for Viora. Um, I was the Clinical Director for uh, the last uh, about seven years, so um, really anything clinical, um, I do. <laughs> so we will uh, we'll go through the VFR workbook today. If you guys have the VFR workbook at home printed, uh, I recommend grabbing it just so you can make notes. Uh, if you don't, that's okay. You can just make notes um, on the side if you'd like, but we do have the VFR workbook pulled up in front of us so you'll be able to see every page. Uh, additionally, I have the VFR handpiece here, so I'll be able to point out, you know, the things that I'm uh, referring to and kind of the hands-on technique. Now, speaking of hands-on, we are going to be kind of Switching it up, for the last month, we have been doing really didactic. So didactic on the IPL and the SP and the V form and the reaction and the VFR. Um, also holding a lot of practice development uh, webinars, which are really, really great. I highly recommend joining one of those if you haven't done so yet. So we'll continue the practice development ones. And the practice development is talking about how to do perfect before and after photos, how to price um, memberships, loyalty programs, how to do a consultation, uh, charting. So really anything that involves practice. Um, so I highly recommend always, you know, jumping on one of those uh, because they're so important. And this is the perfect time because you have the downtime to really put these things into play when you do come back to your office and you come back even stronger than you were before. So I recommend joining one of those. Um, and then we're kind of switching it up the next month where we're going to be doing hands-on. So that was hard for me in the beginning because we're social distancing, but I figured out a way of being able to walk um, you guys through hands-on and also show you the hands-on technique. So we'll be doing that uh, next week, pristine. I'll go through didactic of the pristine. So if you have our microdermabrasion um, and then showing you hands-on with that, then um, we'll be doing IPL, V-Form, VST, one of the days, hands-on, and then um, a VFR hands-on. So that'll be nice. So um, check out uh, vioraonlineacademy.com to see all the dates that we have coming up so you guys can join us for those as well. Okay, so let me just make sure everyone's muted here and we'll get started. All right, so VFR. 
We'll first start talking um, about what is the VFR treat. So with the VFR, we're able to treat for skin lifting, facial rejuvenation and resurfacing, scar reduction, skin tightening, acne scar correction, pigmented lesions, and then epidermal um, texture and tone improvement. So it does a lot. Um, and the reason why it does so much is that we're really able to control the depth of penetration of where are we putting the radio frequency heat? Are we putting it deep into the reticular dermis? Are we putting it in the papillary dermis or are we just staying really superficial in the epidermis? So we're able to give different biological responses depending on where we're putting the heat. Um, additionally, we are able to control the pulse duration, which is really um, how quickly are we delivering this heat into the skin? And we can get different biological responses with that as well. So we will go through um, all of these different topics. First, we'll go through what is radio frequency. So radio frequency, it's a form of electromagnetic energy. Really, when this form of electromagnetic energy comes in contact with our skin's tissue, um, our body doesn't know what it is. It's something foreign to the body. And because it's foreign to the body, the body will naturally want to reject it. And this rejection process, it creates our cells to move around. So we get a molecular movement. And when our cells start to move around, then our cells start to generate heat. So really it's um, not so much that the handpiece is hot and you know, and we're putting it on, on skin. It's more of how is the body responding to this RF that we are putting into the skin. So it's that rejection process. The cells start to move around. Oscillation, it's called molecular movement and we start to generate heat. Um, if you guys were on with us for the last couple, we went through this with V-Form, VST, uh, same process because we're using radio frequency with the VFR as well. Um, and, and I said it's a form of electromagnetic energy and it's part of the EM spectrum, which is called the electromagnetic spectrum. And any device is gonna be part of this EM spectrum. Any laser is gonna be part of the EM spectrum. IPL is gonna be part of the EM spectrum. But so is a lot of things that are just surrounding us in life. Um, UV, so when you go outside. Uh, the uh, color uh, visible spectrum, so it's where our eyes perceive color, where your eye is perceiving my um, jacket as the color of maroon. So that's part of the visible spectrum, colors of the rainbow. Uh, microwaves, cell phones, so really everything that's surrounding us is part of the same spectrum and so is radio frequency because it's a form of energy. Um, okay, so now we'll go into our different biological responses. And with those biological responses, what are they doing to the actual skin? So when we are using our highest heat temperature, which is above 100 degrees Celsius, this is when we're getting into ablation. So ablation is going to be skin resurfacing and epidermal regeneration. So I'm gonna point down here, what is skin resurfacing? It's the removal of the skin surface to create new uh, surface. So um, something like a peel also does this, like a Jesner peel, uh, but we're doing it with just higher heat temperatures. Now, if we take the heat a, a bit lower, which is between 60 and 70 degrees Celsius, we're able to get coagulation or necrosis of our skin cells. I spoke a lot about this with the IPL. IPL is also utilizing this type of heat temperature. And when we do that, we're able to get regeneration of new skin cells. So what happens is we get skin rejuvenation. So we talked a lot about that with IPL, rejuvenating the skin and epidermal and dermal cell production, so keratinocytes. Um, so what is skin rejuvenation? It's the coagulation necrosis of dermal and epidermal layers. So we're able to remember, put the heat in different layers of the skin. If we wanna be deep, um, like the reticular papillary dermis or more superficial, like the epidermis. And then it just promotes the body to create new skin cells, so rejuvenation. And then with heat uh, um, at the lower um, end of the temperature scale from this uh, form here, or chart I should say, when we are between 40 and 50 degrees Celsius, we are able to get fibroblast stimulation, which is going to target collagen, additionally elastin. So if you guys were on with the VSP webinar, we talked a lot about this, right? Because this is the temperature that we're using with the VSP or the V-form, uh, where we're getting a skin tightening effect, neocollagenesis, and collagen remodeling. So this is where we're able to get skin tightening. So 
just looking down here, when we do volumetric heating of the dermis, then we stimulate neocollagenesis. So really what we're doing is we're stimulating fibroblast cells and fibroblast cells then are really in charge of remodeling that collagen, building new collagen and strengthening elastin. So what happens is we get skin tightening, which is skin lifting, um, but we also are able to thicken the skin. So someone that's, that's aging, maybe prematurely dry skin, that they are going to have that thinner skin. So we're able to thicken it for them. Okay, so those are our different biological responses and the definition of those. So now we will go into, um, actually, hold on, let me just see where I'm going to talk about this. Okay, got it. All right, so we have different ways of delivering radio frequency to the tissue. The very first technology that ever came out that was RF-based cosmetically, because RF is used in more than just cosmetics. It's used in the treatments of cancers. It's used in hospital environments, um, surgical environments. So the very first cosmetic RF-based treatment that came out was monopolar. So the problem with monopolar is, and what is monopolar? Monopolar means that there's one electrode on the handpiece, and then you had to use a grounding pad. The grounding pad was working as the negative, where the handpiece electrode is working as the positive. Because with RF energy, you have to be able to deliver and then receive. So it has to have a positive to a negative. So think of like the VST handpiece, if you guys have that one. There's two electrodes on the handpiece. One of them is working as the positive, the other one is working as the negative. But with monopolar, because there was just one electrode on the handpiece, you had to have a grounding pad. So the problem with monopolar is that it was incredibly uncomfortable because you had to use high amounts of radio frequency because it would have to scatter throughout the body to find the grounding pad. But additionally, it wasn't controlled, right? Because it was scattering throughout the body to find the grounding pad. So because it wasn't controlled and because you had to use high amounts of heat, not or it wasn't just uncomfortable but it was also damaging surrounding tissue um and because it wasn't controlled people were getting permanent divots in the skin so permanent fat loss okay so adverse right so then we um really the industry um went towards bipolar energy and that's how um viora really introduced rf to the market we introduced it as bipolar energy when we came on onto the market. So bipolar energy is two electrodes. One is working as the positive and the other one is working as the negative. Again, just like the VST, no more grounding pad. So you can see that just we have a positive and negative electrode fairly close to one another. We don't have to use really high amounts of radio frequency because it doesn't have to scatter throughout the body. Um, so it's very controlled therefore very comfortable because we don't have to use that extreme heat, um, but also very, very safe because it's controlled and we're not really able to create those permanent divots in the skin unless you did something crazy with the handpiece uh, or permanent fat loss or you know damage to the actual um, dermal layers. So that is what the VFR utilizes as well. It's bipolar energy. And there's actually gonna be a visual coming up in just a couple slides where it shows how it's working as bipolar energy. Uh, first, we will talk about uh, fractional technology because the VFR is fractionated radio frequency. So fractional technology was developed by Rox Anderson in 2003. This was um, done Think of like in the 1990s when CO2 and erbium YAG lasers first came out. They, um, what they would do is they're so attracted to water. So they would find the water in the skin and then it would just ablate the full surface of the skin. So the old CO2 and erbium YAGs were not fractionated. So it removed the entire epidermis. Now, there were complications with this. If someone had darker skin, they really shouldn't be doing the, the, um, these type of lasers because there could be a lot of adverse, the way they heal compared to lighter skin types. So they could have a lot of um, PIH, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, but even lighter skin types could, could sometimes have this. Um, additionally, hypopigmentation, where we've damaged the melanocytes in the area. Um, also a ton of downtime. You're removing the full epidermis. So it wasn't social downtime. It was true at home downtime because of the risk of infection. Uh, and also just the way you look. So Rox Anderson developed a fractional way of using these lasers where it would only treat 
fractions of the skin at a time. And that's what the VFR is or it is doing. So when you put the tip on the, on the um, skin, it's not gonna ablate everything because there's tiny little pins. So wherever those pins are at on the skin, that's what's being treated. But we're keeping the surrounding tissue intact. Now, why is that so good? you're not gonna have true downtime because you're not removing the full epidermis. It's just gonna be social downtime. You may have little matrix marks on the skin where the pins were, but you can put makeup on 24 hours later, cover it up. Um, really very, very little risk of infection. Again, because you're only treating just fractions of the skin at a time. Um, I also like to explain it like this, just for how quickly you heal with fractionated technology compared to non-fractional technology. Um, let's say I was in a war and I'm on the um, I'm on the field and I get shot. If there's no one around me when I get shot, I could just lay there and end up not healing at all. There could be a huge problem there. But if I get shot and I have my teammate with me, my fellow soldier with me, and they see that I get shot and they come and scoop me up and run me to the medics, now I'm getting the proper healing I need and I'm gonna heal much faster than if I was just sitting there alone. I want you to think of that like as your skin cells. The surrounding skin cells where you were um, surrounding where you've injured really have created that thermal injury, controlled thermal injury. Those skin cells around that injury are the ones that are helping running over, migrating to that area and helping you heal quicker. So that's why it's so much safer, um, so much faster, um, and really no downtime. It's just social downtime. So fractionated technology was a genius idea by Rock Sanderson. If you ever have a chance to see him speak, I highly recommend doing it. Okay, so um, we have a proprietary, uh, really, technology within the VFR, and we named it because it is pr proprietary, and it's called SVC technology. And it stands for switching, vacuum, and cooling. So those are really our, um, our high, high, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Really what makes it very special, the hand piece very special. Um, so we'll go through each of them separately. So the first thing we'll go through is switching, then we'll talk about the vacuum and why that's so important, and then we'll talk about our cooling system, and again, why that's so important. So switching. We did implement uh, core technology within the VFR. So if you guys heard me speak on the VST or the V-Form, you heard me talk about core technology where we're able to deliver the energy in different depths of the tissue. And it's how the frequency of the wavelength of radio frequency is traveling. So if you have a very long uh, wavelength, you have a very low frequency. It's actually slower and it has time to get deeper into the tissue. When you have a shorter wavelength or a very high frequency, it's faster. So really it's staying more superficial because it's quicker. Um, the frequency is how many times does, does that wavelength peak in the matter of a second? Well, with lasers and IPL, we talk about the nanometer of the wavelength, right? Like the, the length of it. Where with radio frequency, we talk about the frequency of the wavelength and how quickly it's traveling. Even though both are utilizing wavelengths and frequencies, it's just how we, we interpret them is different with, with different technologies. So with um, radio frequency, when we have a lower, lower frequency, we have time to get deeper in the tissue. When it's a faster frequency, we stay more superficial. So that's what those numbers are here. 0.8 megahertz, 1.7 megahertz, and 2.45 megahertz. So this is how we're able to really adjust it. Now, there's a um, also something uh, that really controls the depth of penetration, and that is how, um, how are we firing the energy? How closely are we firing that energy uh, from one positive electrode to the other negative electrode? So I'm actually gonna just show you here. Um, as uh, idea of what I'm speaking on. So here, let me show you the tip really quick. By the way, this is just like my dummy tip. It's what I use for like a lot of Skype trainings and, and things like that. So there's a little black dot here, but it's just, I don't, I don't use it. So I just popped it on here for the, um, the sake of the webinar. So just ignore that. Um, okay, so this is what the tip looks like, right? A lot of you guys have seen this. 
Um, so when I'm talking about the pins firing either closely together or further apart, I'm talking about those little gold pins or tiny little electrodes here. Okay, so that is, this photo is pretty much what that tip looks like, right? So with radio frequency, um, if you guys are familiar with the V-form, think about the different tips you have with the V-form. We have a large one for the full body, and we have a smaller one for smaller areas, right? And there's a big difference in how deep the small one's going to go into the skin compared to the large one. And the reason being is the, half the distance of the electrodes is the depth that it goes into the tissue. So think of the VST. Would the VST be able to, um, let's say, treat really deep on the abdomen compared to the forehead? No, because the electrodes are this far apart, and it's going half the distance between those two electrodes. That's the depth that it's reaching into the skin. So there's a huge difference in the depth of the reticular dermis on the forehead compared to the reticular dermis on the abdomen, right? So how are we able to control if we want to, with the VFR, be in the epidermis, shallow, be in the papillary dermis, medium, or be in the reticular dermis, deep? And it's just how closely we're firing these pins to one another. So when we want to be superficial or shallow, this row here, number one, is going to work as the positive electrodes. And then we would fire right next to it. So number two, row number two, would work as the negative electrodes. So we're firing so close to one another that it's staying superficial. Now, if I want to get deeper, then row one would be the positive, but then row three would be the negative. So we're just firing further apart. And then row two would be the positive, and then row four would be the negative, as an example. And then if we want to get deeper into the reticular dermis, then row one would be the positive, and then row four would be the negative. Then row two would be the positive, and then row five would be the negative. So they're all going to fire when you hit the, um, hit the trigger on the skin. It doesn't matter if you're in um, shallow or deep. They're all going to fire. It's just how closely are they firing to one another. And that's how we're able to control that depth of penetration. Okay, so that's switching. So now we'll go into pulse duration and how we're able to get our different biological responses. So now we know how we can control the depth of penetration we want to be in. Deep, reticular, medium, papillary, or shallow epidermal. But how are we getting our um, different biological responses? Ablation, coagulation, overall fibroblast stimulation for collagen. And this is dependent on the energy that we're using. So the joules of energy that we're using and what pulse duration, what speed are we delivering those energies at? Okay, so I'm gonna have you guys look down here. So um, I'm gonna talk about here how it says that the patient can't afford downtime or if they can't afford downtime after the fact. Um, but the first thing I'll talk about is really just the overall biological responses. So if somebody is just needing fibroblast stimulation and um, overall lifting to their skin or thickening of their skin, then we're going to have a long pulse duration. So it's going to be between 80 and 100 milliseconds. I'm going to break this down in just a second. If someone is needing just ablation, so um, epidermal pigmentation or epidermal textural issues, then we are going to deliver it in a shorter pulse duration between 10 to 50 milliseconds. I'm going to explain this like, um, like a steak with meat on the grill. If I turn my grill up to a really, really high flame, and I put a raw piece of steak on the grill for, uh, I don't know, two minutes on each side, what's going to end up happening to the steak? It's going to burn on the outside, right? Because I had a really high flame, but I only kept it on there for two minutes on each side. So what's going to happen to the center of it? Nothing. It's going to stay raw, right? I want you to think of that like ablation. Higher heat, but shorter, um, a shorter amount of time. So if we take really high heat and really put it into the skin quickly, that's when we're able to ablate and get that overall surface change, right? Textural issues or 
um, pigmentation issues because we're removing that skin that has those issues. Now, if I take another piece of meat, raw meat, and I lower the flame, and let's say it's on like a medium low, and I put the steak on now, let's say six minutes on each side, what's gonna happen to the meat now? It's gonna cook all the way through, right? Um, what's gonna happen to the outside of the steak? Well, nothing really, it's gonna kinda look like the, the really cooked center. Um, it's not gonna burn on the outside. So think of that as your coagulation, um, wanting new skin cells, getting fibroblast stimulation for collagen. It's not gonna ablate the surface, right? Because we didn't use really high heat. Um, we also kept it on there longer. So we're getting deeper for more um, renewal of skin cells or that fibroblast stimulation, but we're not burning the surface of the skin. So now when it talks about downtime, you can see that they're gonna have those matrix marks on the skin when we shorten that pulsation and we put it in at higher heat. That's when we're getting ablation, so they're gonna have the little matrix marks. But if we really draw out that pulsation, we slowly deliver the energy and the energy is lower, this is when we're going deeper. We're getting new skin cell renewal. We're getting that collagen stimulation. So this is when we talk about no downtime, they're not gonna have the matrix marks on their skin. So 10 to 50 milliseconds, an ablative response, 80 to 100 milliseconds, that collagen, elastin, and new skin cell renewal. Now, the beauty of this handpiece, the most exciting part about it, is that we can do both of those at the exact same time. So it's just when we meet them in the middle. So when you're between 55, 60 milliseconds to 70, 75 milliseconds, we're able to get both ablation and coagulation. Of course, if you're closer to the 55 or 60 millisecond range, you're going to get a bit more ablation than if you were at the 70 to 75 millisecond range. Um, so why do we need that? Why would we need both? Think of acne scars. Acne scars, um, sure, we don't like the look of them. We can see that they're superficial and they need that new texture renewal. But if you look at scarring in general, most scarring reaches deep all the way into the reticular dermis as well. So we can't just treat the epidermis for ablation because the scarring where it originates from is deep. So we need to be able to have the depth and that collagen renewal and the new skin cell renewal as well. So this is where this handpiece works so wonderfully for acne scarring is because we can do both. Um, also think of just overall aging skin. So if someone is in their 60s or 70s and they've never done anything to their face, um, sure, they're gonna have laxity, they're gonna have lines, but with those lines and with that laxity, there's probably textural issues as well. So it's really nice for them too because you can improve the textural appearance of their skin, but also go deep for the lifting effect and helping those lines and wrinkles and la overall laxity to their skin. So that is how we're able to control our biological response. Um, now, you just have to be very careful when you're doing ablation, we are able to choose between 10 and 50 milliseconds. I've never treated at 10 milliseconds. I can't even imagine how aggressive that would be. Um, even at 50 milliseconds, it gives really a great ablative response. So just always start safe. Always start on your longer pulse range. Um, uh, if you have that option between like 10 and 50 milliseconds, start slower in your delivery because there's a big difference in taking um, five joules of energy and delivering it in 10 milliseconds, very aggressive, or delivering it in 50 milliseconds slower, even though it's still going to give an ablative response. It's not going to be such a strong, strong uh, response to the skin when maybe you don't know how their skin responds yet anyways because it's their first treatment. So just always stay on the safer, longer pulse duration range when you have these options. Okay. Sorry, my air freshener keeps going off. Um, all right. So now we'll talk about the different um, things that we can treat and really what programs we would be using uh, or protocols we would be using. So pigmentation and textural issues. Actually, this photo here, you can see she has both. She has hyperpigmented probably solar lentigo, it looks like. Um, and then you can see around here that there's those textural issues as well. So with her, you could do um, just overall skin resurfacing. 
we are going to focus on the epidermis. So because we're going to focus on the epidermis, we're going to choose shallow. And our biological response is going to be ablation. So to get ablation, we are going to be in the higher energy range with a shorter pulse duration between that 10 and 50 um, millisecond range. Of course, starting at 50 milliseconds for safety on their first treatment. Um, when it says high energy, we have an option between 1 to 10 for our jewels. I've never worked at 10 joules. I can't even imagine working at 10 joules. Um, even seven joules is aggressive. So also be mindful there that when it says high energy, it doesn't mean just crank it up to eight joules or nine joules. Um, it means that you're probably going to be, you know, um, um, definitely probably not using one or two joules, your, your lowest energy option, um, but be very mindful of how high you are going. Um, a trick on this is how do you know you're getting ablation? The biggest way of knowing is the smell of burnt skin. So when you're treating somebody for the first time and you choose 50 milliseconds, you're still going to always test them. So you'll test at one joule still, your lowest energy, and then you'll go up to 1.25 because it goes by 0.25. You'll go to 1.25, then 1.50, then 1.75, then 2 joules, and then so on and so forth. And I always recommend testing on the side of the face. You don't want to test here because what if something goes wrong, <laughs> right, in the middle of the forehead. So here on areas that it's harder to see if there is, you know, an issue just in case something happened on both sides of the face, on the sides here. Um, but really, I would recommend stopping as soon as you smell burnt skin. You know you're getting into an ablative response anyways. So there's no reason if you're getting the smell of burnt skin at four joules to keep going. It's their first treatment. See how they respond, then you can go up from there. So uh, just a, a recommendation there for ablation. <clears throat> now, if they have fine lines, wrinkles, or dry skin, because it also helps with overall dry skin, which is great. And the reason being, I'll point out this bullet point down here, is that the hydrogen, bond, um, hydrogen bonds that are attached to the collagen, they are able to denature with this higher heat. And then when they denature, um, we, we get an instant contraction, but the hydrogen bonds then rejuvenate and replenish the hydrogen source to the tissue. So that's a really great um, advantage because there's so many people with dry skin, right, um, that you can help them as well. And typically people with really uh, dry skin prematurely aged too. So if they have really dry skin, they're most likely going to have the fine lines and wrinkles. Uh, so the application you're going to want to target is overall skin rejuvenation. So now it says papillary dermis, but not always. So if they have just overall dry skin, sure, just choose medium, which is going to be the papillary dermis. If they have just very fine lines and um, wrinkles, then do the papillary um, medium program. But if they're older and they have very deep folds and very deep lines, most likely those are not originating just from the papillary dermis. Most likely those are originating all the way into the reticular dermis. So think of like an age group, think of how deep those folds are, how deep those wrinkles are, and you'll choose from there. So if they're very deep folds, very deep wrinkles, it's gonna be better to go to the reticular dermis, which is deep. If it's just fine lines and wrinkles, the patient's 45, they don't have those really deep set folds or deep lines yet, um, then papillary dermis is perfect for them, which is medium. Um, so the biological impact that you're going to get is coagulation of skin cells, but you're also gonna get fibroblast stimulation too, just because fibroblast stimulation happens at even lower temperature than what you're gonna be working at. Um, and the treatment settings, again, it says high energy, but we spoke about that. It doesn't mean to go up really high. Um, it, I mean, this, this can work even at two or three joules. So, you know, be mindful of that. And if you start going too high anyways, you are gonna possibly get in ablation, which this isn't the um, application that you're going for, especially on bony areas, even at two joules, if you're, because um, you can choose between 70 and 100 milliseconds, if you really want to be careful with them, if they, you know, can't afford any downtime, they don't want any matrix marks on their skin, just be very um, safe at 100 milliseconds, because you know you're really slowing that delivery down to avoid ablation. Um, but let's say you're 100 milliseconds and you were working four joules down here on the fattier tissue of the face, 
and then you start working up around the eyes and the forehead, you may smell burnt skin even at 100 milliseconds because you were at four or five joules, which is in the higher range. Um, so as soon as you smell burnt skin, you know you're getting into ablation. And with bony areas, that energy can just pop back to the surface of the skin and ablate. So be mindful of that. You're going to want to lower your energy anyways when you start working on bony areas. Um, but even if you lowered it down to like three joules and you smell burnt skin, they're going to have matrix marks on their skin. So just keep lowering it until you no longer smell burnt skin. And remember, even one joule of energy is a lot. So even if you have to, have to take it down to one joule, that's okay. Um, you know, you're still just staying in that application that you want, which is overall skin rejuvenation. All right. Um, so, and then it points out here, this bullet point, when the skin reaches 40 degrees Celsius and above, collagen remodeling starts to occur. So you're also going to get that fibroblast cell stimulation for collagen, um, but additionally new skin cell renewal. All right. Now we'll go into scars, acne scars, and stretch marks, or someone that's older and has those um, wrinkles, maybe those folds, but also textural issues with the lines. Um, then a lot of times they need some ablation, so this is a great application for them as well. Um, so we'll talk about scars, acne, um, scars, and stretch marks uh, more so. So the application is going to be skin rejuvenation and resurfacing, right? So again, if, if they do have textural issues with fine lines and wrinkles, you'll also use this program because it'll give them great, a great response to their skin. So acne scars, we spoke about that, that they're very deep, but also we can see, I mean, even looking at this photo of her, you can see that there's textural issues there, right? So this is when we need to choose the deep program the reticular dermis because these scars these stretch marks are deep but we want two biological responses we want ablation of the epidermis and then we want coagulation of those dermal layers papillary and reticular dermis so um, higher heat energy as high as you need to go to smell burnt skin to get so to know that you're getting into a little ablation and a medium pulse duration. So you can be between um, 50 and 80 milliseconds. So it's usually about like 55 to 75 milliseconds. If you're at 70 or 75 milliseconds or even 80 milliseconds, you're getting more coagulation, less ablation. If you're closer to 60, 55, or 50 milliseconds, you're getting a bit more ablation than you are coagulation. Um, a lot of people like to start just right there in the middle at 70 milliseconds. Um, just they know that they're getting, you know, both. They don't have to question, or, am I giving too much ablation? You're right there in the middle. Now, if you are um, treating them for two to three treatment le treatments, let's say, and their overall textural um, improvement is really, really good, they have, you know, their skin is starting to look really smooth, but you can still see just pivots, like you can still see the, the actual acne scarring, um, then it's okay to adjust as you go. So now, maybe they don't need so much ablation anymore because the textural improvement is really good. Now let's just focus a bit deeper. So you can switch it to 80 milliseconds at this point, or vice versa. If the scarring gets smaller, but the textural um, issue is still there, then go a little bit shorter in your pulse duration to give a little bit more ablation. So this is always you know, dependent on what are you seeing as the patients are coming in, and how do I adjust it um, based on what I'm seeing? And you have this controllability. Okay, so. That is um, our different applications that we would be using the handpiece for. So now we'll talk about vacuum. So again, SVC technology, switching, vacuum, cooling, and now we'll talk about vacuum. So vacuum, it's going to aid, actually, let me just show it to you really quick. Where is the vacuum on the handpiece? So the vacuum, I can actually stick my finger in it right here because there's an opening. So the vacuum is going to be on both sides of the handpiece. So it's right, it's just right inside there and it's right inside there. So the vacuum is going to aid in pain. It's the gate theory. Um, it's the same reason uh, when you guys, if you've been on my other webinars where I talk about pressure is key. So with the VST, the more pressure you have, the more comfortable they're going to be. 
Why? Because if I just barely put the tip on the, um, or the electrodes on the skin, and just was barely touching the skin and pulsed with higher heat energy, that's all they're going to feel is that heat. But if I really push and then fire the energy, their brain doesn't know, am I feeling pressure? Am I feeling heat? I don't know. I feel both. So I'm comfortable or more comfortable. Um, same with the IPL. I like to use a lot of pressure unless I'm working on vascular lesions. And then you can't because then you're just pushing the blood source out and you don't have a target. Um, so pressure is really key. I also use quite a bit of pressure with the VFR too for comfort. But we also have an additional way of comfort and that's the vacuum. So again, it's tricking the nerves. When the vacuum activates, it couples in the tissue into the applicator. So they're feeling that along with all of the electrodes firing. So it just keeps them a lot more comfortable than if it was just those little, tiny little electrodes firing at higher heat and um, uh, temperatures, especially with ablation, they're going to really feel that strongly, even with numbing cream. So that vacuum really aids in bringing down that, that pain because it's tricking the nerve. It's giving the nerves something additional to feel. Um, and then mm, I, I, I almost said moreover, but they're both important. Additionally, I should say, we can see here on the skin that this was a perfect matrix uh, matrix marks, right? That the handpiece was nice and flush on the skin and all of the pins fired properly. And the vacuum aids in that because when it couples the tissue on both sides of the applicator, it really kind of forces the handpiece to be down and nice and flat on the skin. So all of the pins are flat. So we're not getting into any issues of like creating a um, superficial blister or burn. And we also have very symmetrical matrix marks. Um, okay, so ensuring that it just couples in the tissue and staying nice and flat. So that is the vacuum. And if you guys wanted to know, it's up to 350 millibars. You'll probably never talk about that. <laughs> but good to know. And this next page, it just explains the, the gate theory of pain. You know, that the, the initial feeling is a vacuum and it kind of, there's a gate in our brain that kind of closes off then the secondary sensation of heat. Okay, so now we will talk about cooling. So cooling, it's, um, it's a technology that we've put into, into the handpiece and it's called TEC, Thermal Electric Cooling. And it's the same cooling that the VST handpiece has. So when you touch the electrodes of the VST when it's turned on, you can feel that they're nice and chilled. And that's to keep the patient comfortable, but also protect their epidermis. So we put that into place with the VFR as well. So the cooling plate is going to keep them a lot more comfortable, just like the vacuum. Um, but additionally, it's I like to explain it that it's keeping it in, um, we talked about that it's a fractionated technology, so it's only treating fractions of the skin at a time, and it's aiding in that. The cooling is this plate, the full plate that you're seeing here that's kind of almost like a green color. So the cooling plate is surrounding each of those tiny little electrodes there. So you're ensuring that you're keeping the surrounding cells intact by keeping them cool, but then creating the thermal response, the, the um, thermal controlled injury where the pins are, but keeping the surrounding tissue safe and then also helping with overall comfort too. So that whole thing is the cooling plate there. Okay. Now we'll talk about smart heat. So you guys have probably, when I hold this up on the screen, you guys have seen these two larger electrodes that are on both sides of the tiny electrode pens. Those two large electrodes are called smart heat. And smart heat is just aiding in the depth of penetration. So when you trigger, the first thing that's gonna fire is the smart heat before the tiny electrodes fire. And what that is doing is it's just delivering one joule of energy to the tissue. So from positive to negative, one joule of energy into the tissue before those electrodes fire. Why we want that is it's just aiding in depth of penetration. So when we just slightly heat that tissue, then it allows those tiny electrodes to penetrate deeper when we want them to penetrate deeper. Um, so it's really allowing it to have better skin impedance. 
so we don't have really resistance in the skin because we can have resistance in the skin, um, which is where the energy stays very superficial and gives an ablative response when we don't want it. And we want to make sure we, we properly get down to that reticular dermis. So that one joule of energy and warming of, of the tissue is going to help that. Now, we don't always keep the smart heat on. When would we turn it off? When we don't want to penetrate deeper. So if we just want ablation, if we just want to treat um, superficial hyperpigmentation or superficial textural issues, we don't want to go deep. We want to stay superficial. So we turn the smart heat off. Um, there's never a time that I turn the cooling plate off because there's three things that you can turn on or off. The smart heat, the cooling, and the vacuum. So I'll talk about when I would turn the vacuum off. But the cooling, I never turn off. Um, you can if you um, are doing just ablation because you're just wanting to really get to that high heat temperature on the surface. Um, but even when I do ablation, I still keep the cooling plate on for comfort, but also for safety, just to make sure I keep those surrounding cells intact. So that's just a personal preference. Um, if you have a hard time like getting to the ablative response you want to get to, then sure, you can pop off the cooling plate. Um, additionally, you can adjust the, um, the, the vacuum on or off. So I keep the vacuum on always, except for if they have really cuperose skin, so a ton of broken capillaries in the area, I'll turn the vacuum off. Um, if they are older with very thin skin, and as soon as I start pulsing, I see that they're starting to petechiae, and um, I can immediately see the bruising, then sure, I don't want their whole face to be bruised, so I would turn that vacuum off. Just make sure that if you need to turn the vacuum off um, on your older clientele that may have thin skin, just use uh, better pressure with the handpiece for their comfort because that's going to make, make a huge difference in what they're feeling. Um, and then numbing creams are always so great um, to use beforehand. Just make sure you're using a good numbing cream. You know, there's a lot of numbing creams out there and it could have a good percentage of like benzocaine or tetracaine or lidocaine, but the actual, um, the actual uh, cream and what it's made of may not be great for penetrating into the skin. So make sure you find a really good one for this handpiece because you're going to need to use it quite a bit, especially like if you're using it for the labia treatments. Um, that's a sensitive area. So a good numbing cream is going to be important. So this page just walks through really the, the overall healing. What's going on in the skin when we create this microthermal injury to the tissue. So the first thing that you're gonna um, that you're gonna get is uh, inflammation, right? We we actually can see it. We can see the heat. We can see the swelling a lot of times, and that's an inflammatory response that we're wanting. And after the overall uh, inflammation, really the most important things of healing is, first of all, the proliferation. So it's the proliferation of fibroblast cells that start the overall healing process. And that's when we get the proliferation of fibroblast cells in the healing process, that's when we get that neocollagenesis, new collagen remodeling. Um, this is when we get the new skin cell turnover for skin rejuvenation. Um, this is when it starts to heal the epidermis with ablation. Uh, so then the remodeling, now the remodeling happens, and I'm so sorry that this is so small and you can't see it very well, but really it's just saying minutes to hours is the inflammation response. And then a couple days later is the proliferation response. And then weeks to months out is the actual remodeling process. So collagen is a very slow, slow process within the skin, within the body. Um, once you create that controlled thermal injury, it's the, the collagen is not going to remodel in a week or two. The collagen is going to remodel for three to four months, even sometimes up to six months after the treatment. So um, what, we're, we're, what we are really focused on is the proliferation of collagen. So it doesn't mean that we have to wait three to four months to do the next treatment. No, because we already had that proliferation process where those fibroblast cells already started to remodel the collagen. So now it's safe to go back in uh, four to six weeks after. And we'll talk about the time frame in just a bit and more detail. Um, but what I really want to point out with collagen remodeling and it being a slow process is that let's say you did six treatments on somebody. After their sixth 
uh, treatment, like a couple weeks later, when the matrix marks are gone, that is not their final result. Their final result is really three to four months after the last session. So it's very important to always bring your patients back in three to four months later to get their after photo. And that's when you would then sit down with them and show them before they ever came in, um, maybe after their um, fifth treatment, you know, second to last treatment because you had photos then. And then now three to four months later and, and that process and how much better their skin got even when they weren't doing treatments. So it's always exciting for them. And it's really when you're going to see their, their, um, their best result is going to be those months after. Okay, downtime. So we spoke about downtime. Again, it's social downtime. It's not true downtime. They don't have to stay indoors. Um, they can put makeup on 24 hours later, just not in those first 24 hours, but 24 hours later, they can put makeup on if they need to, um, to cover the marks. So the um, face is going to heal much quicker than the body. And the reason being is it's talking about density here, right? The face has high density, the body has low density. What that means is, oh, by the way, I just got a comment. I just saw that. So if you guys have questions as I'm speaking, you can go into the, um, it's at the bottom of your screen. If you're on your phone, I'm not quite sure where it's at, but on the computer, the bottom of your screen, you have a lot of things that you can do down there. One of them is to ask a question. So I can see all those questions and I'll be able to answer them for you. Um, additionally, I'm going to open it up for questions after I'm done speaking. Uh, where you can unmute yourself and ask the question and we can have a discussion, which I love when people do that. Uh, so you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and ask me. Um, so I'll look at your question in just a bit. Um, okay, so it says high density and low density. Now, what that means, the density means really our sebaceous glands. And we have such a high amount of sebaceous glands and sebum production on our face compared to our body. So with that overall sebum and think of like moisture in the skin, that helps speed healing um, so, so much. And, and the reason why I'm stressing that so much is I'm going to talk about post-treatment care guidelines and wearing um, an emollient on your skin because it's such a high moisture content that it helps speed healing along. So with our face having so much more uh, sebaceous glands and overall sebum and it's staying very hydrated, it heals quicker. So these little matrix marks that you're seeing on the skin, those will be gone in five to seven days on the face, now on the body. So if you did stretch marks and scars on the body, if you treated the labia, even though the labia heals faster than most areas because it's already an area that stay, it always stays um, very moisturized in general, so it heals quicker than the rest of the body. But um, stretch marks and scars on the body, those matrix marks can be on the skin for up to 21 days. So just make sure that your clients know this, your patients know this. Um, you know, they don't treat their decollete for bra lines, um, deep lines that they may have there uh, a week before their wedding. <laughs> That's not going to be good. So it just takes longer. And also that they know um, it is going to be there uh, for up to 21 days. They have to take care of that area for a couple of weeks as well, a few weeks as well. Um, so here it just shows photos of um, what to expect on the skin. So when we're using a shorter pulseration, you can see what it looks like one day post, three days post, and then um, seven days post. This could be on the body. Um, typically on the face, that would be gone. Uh, even the face, though, it could take up to 10 days. Um, medium pulse duration, you can see that you can just barely see the matrix marks, not nearly as aggressive as your shorter pulse duration, and they're all almost gone within that seven days. If, if, if it was on the face, it would probably be gone. And then a long pulse duration, we do have redness after. So they are still going to feel hot because it's heat. You know, it's hot. the VFR in general is higher heat. So they're still going to be hot after the treatment. They're still going to be red, um, but they're not going to have those matrix marks on the skin. So you can see that you know, it looks really good after three days. You know, they don't have that social downtime. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about um, actually doing the treatment and how you're moving the handpiece and how you're overlapping and how you're testing. Um, let me just check here. I got a question. Let's see what's going on in the chat. Um, we usually use 
LED light to reduce inflammation after treatment to reduce the reaction and help the client feel more comfortable. Do you advise stopping that? Does it affect the results since we are um, inducing this inflammation? Um, okay, so this is a tricky one because I know, I mean, LED light, it's, it's great for so many reasons, right? Like using an LED blue light after treating um, acne with your IPL is great. Um, you know, doing the IPL skin rejuvenation, as long as they don't have too much heat, putting them in front of a red LED light. <sighs> with the VFR, just write me if you've ever had any complications with this. I'm just curious. But with the VFR, I'm so ultra, ultra conservative with everything I'm doing with this handpiece because it is such an aggressive handpiece. And um, I'm usually ultra conservative with really not wanting to do anything else after. Um, additionally, like what the instructions I have for what they're doing at home, I'm very ultra conservative with it as well because most of the time we don't have any adverse with the actual handpiece when you're using it properly. Most of the time, any adverse that you ever see with this handpiece is what they're doing after the procedure and how they're taking care of their skin after. So just write me, let me know if you've ever had any complications with this. Um, and, and I understand, you know, with, with reducing the inflammation after the treatment that it can ease them and ease that overall because um, it's very hot after the treatment. Um, but also we want an inflammatory response, right? We want heat. So I'm kind of torn here. Uh, but I also will give them an ice pack because a lot of times they're so hot that they have to have that ice pack. So that's also bringing down that heat and that inflammation. So I'm just curious if you've ever had any type of like any adverse with it. I'm guessing that you have it if you're continuing to do it. Um, by the way, if you're in the U.S., and you're part of the IRB study, the person that just asked this, or anybody, then no, you wouldn't be using the LED just because it's an IRB study, so we can't. We, we really cannot do anything pre and post this handpiece um, because it's in study. So if you're in the States, you wouldn't want to do it anyways. If you're not in the States, just feel free to let me know um, if you've seen any like issues after. Okay, I got one more question. Um, can we treat post-laser burn marks? If yes, then what are the settings for that? What are the post VFR home care remedies would be great to use? I'm going to go through all the post treatment treat um, post treatment care guidelines. Um, so I'll save that for when we go over that. Um, and then post uh, treat post laser burn marks. Absolutely. However, you cannot treat them too soon. So um, any type of burns with uh, um, any type of device. Uh, lasers, IPLs, radio frequency, you really need to be careful with that and really allow healing time. So if they have burn marks that are three to four months old, so maybe it's PIH, um, maybe it's, you know, not PIH, just uh, overall burn mark, then wait, just wait three to four months, allow them to properly heal and then go in with it. Um, Surgical scars, really we say, you know, still wait three months, um, but some of our doctors are, are using it sooner. But with any type of like device burns, you have to be very careful with that and, and just allow healing first. Okay, let me look at the time here. I always give a break um, with uh, all of our webinars, just in case you need to use the restroom, get coffee or water or something like that, and so you don't miss out on anything. So actually, this is a perfect time because it's an hour in, and we have about an hour to go. So I'm stopping right here in the middle. So what we'll do is we'll take a 10-minute 10 10-minute uh, break. I recommend to not sign off um, just because it's a bit more difficult for you to then sign back on and do all that. So um, you can just keep Keep this turned on, you're muted, your camera's not on anyways. Um, I'm gonna keep mine on and we will come back, let's say we're gonna come back 10 minutes after the hour. So in 10 minutes, 11 minutes, but 10 minutes after the hour to keep it easy. Um, and then we'll go through all the other things. Okay, so we'll see you in 10 minutes.
Okay, uh, we will start again. So we are gonna start with the test procedure, which with this handpiece, you really, really, really cannot uh, skip the test procedure. I um, cannot emphasize that enough. And I'm just gonna, before I go through that full test procedure, I just wanna point out something down here um, that your waiting period after your test procedure. So for skin types one through three, once you test on the sides of their face, you'll bring them back one to two days later to assess the skin response. And the higher um, parameter, and it looks good, and it looks like it, um, you know, isn't gonna create any type of complications, then you can move forward with that. For skin types four through six, wait five to seven days because before assessing the skin response, because they can have a very delayed response. So it's gonna be, you know, five to seven days later on the face, you're gonna be able to see what the marks look like after the full healing process. Cause usually seven days later, if you were doing any type of ablation, those matrix marks would be gone. And just making sure that it really looks um, like there isn't gonna be any complications for them. Uh, very, very um, safe to wait five to seven days. Okay, so how are you testing? Your, um, your energy goes by 0.25. So again, start on the side of the face. If you're treating stretch marks or scars, then you'll just start in a small area um, where the stretch marks or scars are on the body. If you're gonna do the face, start on the side of the face and really right where, I have a lot of, uh, I have um, aggressive sideburns, but right really where my sideburns are, you're not gonna be able to go over the hair area, but you can just move that off to the side. And starting at one jewel, I like to work in vector rows working up, and I like to work vertically. Um, I, I recommend for you guys to do that as well. So starting here, I would pulse one jewel, and I'm gonna wait a minute or two, making sure you know that it looks okay. And then I'm gonna go up to 0.25. And then I'm gonna go right above where I would just, was just at, at 1.25. Again, wait a minute or two, then 1.5, then 1.75, then two joules, so on and so forth. Don't come too far out on the face. If you um, have run out of room, let's say at like your second row here, then come over to this side of the face, just because you don't want any complications being out towards the front of the face. So move over here. Um, where do you stop? So if you're doing like fine lines and wrinkles, just overall lifting, overall just skin rejuvenation, and you're not getting into a, um, an ablative response, I would highly recommend stopping at three joules um, on everybody's first treatment. It may sound low, but it really is not. And you just always want to start so safe on everybody's first treatment. You just never know. And this is an aggressive handpiece. And it's aggressive in a good way because it gives really great results, but you want to be very safe with it as well. Um, so I'd stop at three. Then if they heal great and they come back in four to six weeks later for their next treatment, then you can treat a bit higher. You can go to 3.5. And before you finish their treatment, their first treatment, just test in an area at 3.5. And so you can assess that and see how it looks four to six weeks later. That spot looked great, wonderful. You can move forward with that. Then the next time they come in, they can go to four joules. Or then the next time they come in from four joules, they can go to five joules. So just you're slowly working your energy up as, as you're going through their course of treatment, knowing that they're gonna heal properly. Um, now, if you're needing an ablative response, so if, you're, if they're coming in just for ablation or if they're coming in for acne scars, so they need a mix of coagulation and ablation, then I would stop as soon as you smell burnt skin. So as soon as you get that smell, you can either smell the tip or you can actually smell their skin, but as soon as you get that smell, just stop there. And you can always go up from there, their second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth treatment, you can slowly work their energy up a bit more each time. Um, if you still don't get the smell of burnt skin at five joules, don't go any further. It's just their first treatment. You want to stay very safe on them um, and, you know, make sure that they heal well. So you can always go up from there. Usually everybody's going to get the smell of burnt skin within the four joule range. Um, I don't even think I've run into anybody that hasn't gotten the smell of burnt skin um, at five joules. So it's it's still very high. Um, but if you get the smell of burnt skin at 3.5 joules, just stop there. Um, okay, so 
That is the testing procedure. Oh, and by the way, if somebody is um, has melasma and you're treating for that, or is susceptible to melasma because they've had it in the past, high heat temperatures can aggravate that. So um, what you're gonna do for anybody that is susceptible to melasma or actually has it and wants to treat it, you're gonna put them on a melanin inhibitor. So um, some it would be a topical product and they would wear this morning and night for two to four weeks before their first treatment. I would say four weeks just to be extra safe. Um, so some ingredients to look for would be vitamin C, kojic acid, uh, green tea, B3, um, probably our most popular is hydroquinone, um, which can just be called in as a prescription. Um, there are good skincare lines out there that carry really good uh, melanin inhibitor topical products. Uh, SkinCeuticals has three that are really good. Um, defense, color defense. If somebody's on here and, and knows the name of the SkinCeuticals, uh, ones you can just write in the chat, which would be helpful because uh, I forget sometimes, but they have one called Advanced Pigment Corrector. They have one that's um, Oh, something defense, color defense. And then they have a third one too. And somebody just wrote in. So maybe somebody shared with us. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, discoloration defense. I don't know why I always forget that one. So discoloration defense, advanced pigment corrector, and then there's an additional one. And they have a really good skincare line. Um, Skin Medica has one, a little bit lower price point, And that is Lytera 2.0, which is great. Um, Obagi has one called Obagi number three. Just make sure because Obagi is really big on treating melasma. So they put a lot of like retinol type of products in some of their um, some of their topicals. So just make sure whichever one that they're going to get on doesn't have any type of retinol because that would make the skin too sensitive to have the actual treatments. So it needs to be something that it is not a retinol based. Um, and there's so many other skincare lines out there that have good uh, melanin topical inhibitors. So, you know, you can look around, just make sure that there are, <clears throat> there are higher percentages of like vitamin C or kojic acid or um, there's other ingredients too. If you just Google melanin inhibitor ingredients, you'll get a long list of them. So just make sure it's, it's a good one. Um, let's move now to actual trope point. Oh, and then we'll go to operational technique. Okay, so this is what your endpoint is going to look like. So a shorter pulsation, you'll get edema right away. So there's quite a bit of swelling with a short pulsation, which is ablation. Um, so there will be swelling. And then as the swelling goes down, and there will be redness too. And as the swelling and the redness starts to fade away, then you know, a couple hours later, and especially four hours later, they'll see the matrix marks on the skin. So that's what is to, um, to be expected. With a medium pulsation, sometimes they get a little swelling, not nearly as aggressive as ablation. They'll have redness, and then you'll see four hours post that they'll have the matrix marks as well. And then the longer pulsation, minimal swelling, um, but redness for sure, they'll have redness. And then they really shouldn't have marks after. Okay, oops, Let's see if I missed anything there. We talked about burnt skin. Okay, good, we covered that. All right, so a, a few things I'll point out here. Um, before the procedure, you wanna make sure that the skin is completely clean. In a consultation, I would just tell them, please come in with no makeup. I mean, you're gonna have to remove it all anyway, so why take the time to put it on? Um, if they're coming from work and they couldn't help it, then just make sure the skin is very clean before you start. Um, you'll also want to take, I like to use a piece of gauze, a four by four non-woven piece of gauze, spray the gauze with 70% alcohol, and then you're gonna use the alcohol on the skin. And you're doing this for a couple reasons. Biggest one is making sure that the skin is very sterile. Um, additionally, it removes the oil. So any type of, if somebody has really bad um, acne scarring, a lot of times they have oily skin. And that oil can kind of create a barrier. And you don't want that. So removing that barrier, making sure that the skin is nice and sterile with that 70% alcohol. Um, opening the tip, do you see how when she pulled that um, piece of paper off the tip, she didn't pull it all the way off? 
I like to do that as well because the, the tips are reusable. So it's going to be one tip per patient, of course, because we don't want to cross contaminate. Um, but if, if each tip has 600 pulses, so if you only use 300 pulses, then you have a whole nother treatment with that tip. So what you'll do is when you're done with the tip, you'll clean it, and I'll talk about that in just a second, you'll put it back in its package, and then um, because you didn't pull that piece of paper all the way off, you'll just put it back on and tape around the edges to seal it and make sure that it stays sterile. I also then put it in a, in a baggie and seal the baggie as well. And then it's something really easy. You can just write their name on the baggie. Uh, so they have that baggie throughout their full course of treatment. And then um, you're going to get a pop-up after every 20 pulses that says, please clean the tip. And it comes with a little brush. And that little brush is used to brush the actual tip because we start to get an accumulation of dead skin cells here. Never ignore that pop-up. If you just ignore it and keep going, this is when you can get superficial burns on the skin, which you do not want. I prefer, instead of the brush that we provide, I prefer a toothbrush. <laughs> I know that probably sounds funny. But it's nice because it has a, more of a grip, a handle, and it's easy to scrub. Um, you can go and, you know, buy them in bulk on Amazon, uh, really cheap toothbrushes. So each patient would have their own toothbrush and you would just keep that toothbrush in the baggie with their tip. Um, so if, if dead skin cells are hard to get off, if you're doing a lot of ablation and you're scrubbing the tip with the toothbrush and you're looking at it and you can still see that it looks dirty, then just with your spray bottle of alcohol, spray the tip of the toothbrush, or if you're just using the brush that came with it, spray that and then scrub. And that will help loosen up those dead skin cells. Just don't spray the alcohol actually on the tip. Just do it on the toothbrush or the brush that came with it and then scrub. Um, when I'm done with the full treatment, I also spray the toothbrush with alcohol and then I scrub the tip clean. And um, then I put it in its package and seal it and then put the toothbrush in. Okay. So now we'll talk about um, actually doing the treatment and how you get a good overlap. In your workbook and in your training material, it is going to say this, to just line it up with the vacuum marks. However, uh, we have found a better way of doing this because if you line it up with the vacuum marks, you do want a perfect overlap. You can see here, you want that 10% overlap of the full face. You wanna cover the full face, right? But if you line it up with the vacuum mark, it really creates spacing and we don't want that. So I'm gonna teach you a different way. Okay, it's a rolling technique. So you don't wanna put it on the skin, pulse, then pick it up, put it on the skin and pulse, pick it up, put it on the skin and pulse, pick it up. You're going to have, you're going to look at them two days later and they're just going to be stamped all over their face if you were doing any type of ablation. Um, if you were doing coagulation, you just missed a lot of the skin. So let me scoot up closer here. Ooh. <laughs> I can barely fit in this tight area, but I want to get close to the, actually I can move my computer closer too. There we go. So we figured out a rolling technique that when you do this, you do, do end up getting a perfect um, overlap of your pulses. So always remember that the vacuum, that's not treating the skin. Even the smart heat, the two gold electrodes, ignore that because that's not treating the skin either. What's treating the skin are just these tiny pins here. So keep in mind, when you're overlapping, you're probably most likely when you first start working with the handpiece, you're probably gapping more than you are getting a tight overlap because it can be deceiving. This is actually pretty small. So what you're going to do is you're going to pulse and then instead of picking up, you just roll it over to the side and and you can see that only that part of the skin would have been treated. And you just barely slide it up and then roll it over again, pulse, don't pick it up, slide it to the side. Then you can see only that area would have been treated, so just barely slide it up. So if you get done with this row here in three pulses, you don't have a tight enough overlap. That row here would probably be six, six or seven. So just keep that in mind. So again, I'm gonna show you here. Okay, so pulse, roll, slide. Pulse, roll, slide. Pulse, roll, 
slide. Polls, roll, slide. Um, I'm doing an actual hands-on um, next week. Not next week, but the week after. And then next week's gonna be hands-on with the other hand pieces. So I recommend getting on there because I'll actually show you the hands-on technique. Um, okay, so now let's say we finish one row. Now, how do we get a tight overlap then of each individual row and not having gaps of your, of your vector rows? So you can see here, you want them to be right next to one another. Of course, you wanna cover the full face. So. What you're going to do is, no matter what energy you're using, they're going to be red. So you're going to use the redness as your guide. Now keep in mind, there's a lot of plastic surrounding the sides of the handpiece. So again, it can be deceiving. Additionally, heat spreads a little bit, so that can be deceiving too. So let's say I just finished that row, and I can see how big or how red and how wide the redness is. What you're going to do is you're going to put the tip sideways, half into the red, so half of what you just treated, ah, my earrings, half into the red, and then slide over. And then that will be your second row. Then after you're done with your second row, then you're going to put it half into the red of what you just treated. So half into the red of the second row you just treated, then roll over. It's going to feel like, oh, scary, like I'm, I'm overlapping too much. I promise you, you're not. You just put it half into the red of what you just treated and roll it over, it will be right next to one another. So I hope that's a helpful tip. Now, when you're treating things like the lips and you wanna get really close to the lip line because they may have you know, wrinkles, fine lines and wrinkles there, what you'll do, it kind of freaks them out in the beginning, but it's fully safe. You're gonna put the gold electrode all actually on the lip because remember we have a protocol called plump rf where we're actually taking rf energy over the pink of the lip it's safe and this is just smart heat it's not um an ablative type of response this gold bar is not think of that like the st almost so you're going to put the gold bar on the edge of the lip right on the edge of the pink put the gold bar on the pink of the lip right on the edge there and then roll it over just be very mindful you're really watching this as you're doing it and then roll it over and then that's where you would pulse so you can get treatment all the way up to the lip line and then same with the top lip it would be this gold bar put it actually on the lip and roll it over just take your time doing that um uh, same with the eyes we can treat the eyelids for lifting you just don't want to be on the hair and you don't want to pulse on the eyeball so you'll really stretch the skin up and roll it over and ignore the smart heat. Because remember, just those pins are treating the tissue. Um, nose as well, under the eye. So sometimes it breaks them out. I still keep the vacuum on on the eyes. And I know it probably sounds weird, but it just helps so much with pain. And um, sometimes it feels like it's like on their eyelashes because the hip is a bit larger, so the vacuum can be like on the eyelashes. It's not gonna do anything to them. It just helps with comfort, but of course, take the vacuum off um, if, you, if you need to. There's, there's nothing wrong with taking that vacuum off, um, especially if they like tend to bruise easily around the eyes. You don't wanna do that. But just ignore that smart heat. I mean, don't totally ignore it. You don't want it on hair, but just remember that's not what's treating the skin. And then just slide it over and you can do right underneath the brow. You can do right underneath the eye, um, getting really nice and close. And use your hand as a tool. Really pull the skin down. Really pull the eyelid up to be able to be on the bone because we want to be on the bone and not actually pulsing on the eye. All right. Oh, and then one other thing. When you're treating the forehead, a lot of times it's hard to get the vacuum to activate. So you'll just squish the tissue. Just squish it up. So let's say I was treating right there, or sorry, right here, so I don't have to squish my makeup. <laughs> I would just squeeze the skin and it helps activate the, the vacuum because this is a bony curved area. So sometimes the vacuum just can't suck that tissue in. But if you create like a padding and a squishiness for the vacuum to suck in the tissue, that will be very, very helpful. So squeezing it helps. Okay. 
So this is just a little chart here that um, is helpful on what program do I use um, when I'm treating wrinkles, when I'm treating acne scars, when I'm treating skin laxity, when I'm treating dry skin, the program, the depth that you're going to be using, the pulse duration you'd be using, the energy that you could be in the range of um, if the smart heat is on or off. Remember when we're just doing ablation, skin textural and epidermal hyperpigmentation, the smart heat will turn off. So um, just a nice little chart there to, to help you guys. We have this separately. So if you guys live in the United States, um, you guys have something called a customer portal. So we have like these types of cheat sheets on there on myviewer.com customer portal. Um, if you guys live overseas and you don't have this chart, you've never seen it and you want it to laminate and put on your device as a reminder, um, just contact your distributor because they have all of this material um, that they can pull from. If you guys are the distributor and you're on here and you haven't seen this, then just contact Fiora and they will give you access to that. Okay, so now we're going to talk about post-procedure. Actually, I'm going to pull something up different. Hold on here. Give me a second. Oh, that's right. Okay, so I got to do a new share. How can I do this? Sorry guys, give me one second here. I updated the um post-procedure uh, treatment care guidelines, and I just want to show you guys that file. So I just pulled that up, so now I can share with you guys. There we go. Okay. So um, this is just a better sheet to show you because it really walks through all of the important things which are so important. Like I said, most adverse comes from people not taking care of their, um, of their skin after. And with this hand piece, it's so imperative. So if you've never seen the sheet, then you're going to want to get it because everybody should be given the sheet at their consultation and after their first few treatments. So they always remember what to do and they never forget and, and go outside of this. Um, so very important. And I would highly recommend after the first treatment, sitting down and really walking them through all of these bullet points. Um, and it prints out just to be one sheet, which is great. Okay, so um, it talks about like immediately after that they can use cold compresses or ice packs and I just recommend having those in your office. The cheapest and easiest way of doing this, which I just prefer, is taking a glove. I like latex gloves because it gives more of a barrier between the ice and the skin. Um, but if they're allergic to latex, then don't do that. Um, if it's too cold in the glove, then you can just wrap the glove with gauze and then give it to them. Um, but I just take a glove and put ice in it and then tie it like a balloon. And that's their cold pack to put on their face. I give them one of those even before the treatment because when I'm done with this side of the face and now I come to this side of the face, this side of the face is most likely going to feel like on fire. It's hot. Um, so then they can just be holding that on their skin while you're doing this side. Um, it also kind of keeps them distracted a bit. So um, ice packs, usually they typically always need because their skin is so hot after. Um, immediately after you're done with the treatment, what you're going to do is you're going to put a water-based emollient on the skin. I do not recommend just a regular like post-laser cream or serum or just a good moisturizer. It's not enough. Um, anything that absorbs into the skin is not going to be enough to really keep them protected. Um, 
And I know this seems kind of crazy, like, oh, well, we use these post-laser serums for everyone and they're fine. But with this BFR, I just can't stress to you how aggressive this handpiece really is and, and how the healing process is so important for them to take care of their skin properly. Again, it's aggressive in a good way because it gives phenomenal results, but you just want to make sure they heal properly. So the, my favorite one that I've ever found, it's called L to MD. So I just put this on here. Um, by the way, you can, um, you can adjust this if you, know, if you don't have the ability to carry L to MD or get L to MD. You don't have to have this on the sheet. You can change it. Um, but a topical emollient L to MD intense moisture, that's what it's called. And it's similar to like a Vaseline consistency or like Aquaphor, if you guys know what Aquaphor is. Um, but everyone knows what Vaseline is. So it's similar to that consistency in emollient where it's not going to absorb into the skin. It actually creates, creates a barrier. They're really shiny. A lot of people don't like it, but I make them do it anyways. Just always keep in mind when you put this on their skin, it traps in the heat a bit. So have your ice packs ready for them to, to be able to ice. And then it cools down fairly quickly, but it does heat up initially. Um, if you can't get this L to MD, and by the way, L to MD intensive, intense moisturizer, it's very cheap. That's also why I like it. It's great and it's cheap. So um, a big thing of it sells for like $10 on Amazon. And that big thing of it will last them throughout their full course of treatments, which is great. Um, so you could sell it at your office or just make sure to have them get it. I recommend just having it at your office though so you can actually hand it to them and know that they're going to be using it. So you'll, um, if you don't have access to L to MD, Aquaphor is another good um, option. And Aquaphor for it is cheap. You can get it really anywhere. Um, even overseas. I've been to probably whatever country that you're logging into from. I've probably been there uh, training. So I have found Aquaphor in every country that I've gone to. I've had to do some searching sometimes, but it has been available. Um, okay, so they'll keep that on for 24 hours after their treatment. That evening, they can cleanse. And what I recommend for them to use is a very, very gentle skin cleanser. My favorite, it's very cheap as well, is called Cetaphil. And again, any country that I've ever been to, I have been able to find Cetaphil as well. So Cetaphil, uh, Cetaphil I never know how to pronounce it, Cetaphil or Cetaphil, anyways. They have something called gentle skin cleanser. Don't buy the daily facial cleanser, um, or they shouldn't buy the daily facial cleanser. They should buy the gentle skin cleanser. It's It pumps out almost like a lotion, and that's what they'll use to cleanse their skin before they go to bed, but then immediately pop on this emollient. Um, I tell them to get like a clean clean for sure, clean but like old t-shirt that they don't care about and put that over their pillowcase. Otherwise it gets, that stuff gets all over their pillowcase. If they have that cotton t-shirt, it will just absorb and it won't get onto their pillowcase. Um, so they'll sleep with that on. Um, next morning, again, they can cleanse with that gentle skin cleanser and pop the emollient right back on. Um, I don't want them to use like any type of toners, nothing, just that gentle skin cleanser and the emollient. Now, 24 hours later, if they need to go back to work, I still want them to wear this. So they would still put that on, but then they can take a Kleenex, um, not toilet paper because it would stick on their face, but a Kleenex and just dab it until it's not super shiny. And then they can put their makeup on on top of that. Once they get home from work, immediately uh, cleanse their skin and pop that right back on. Um, if they are very oily and acne prone, and this is making them break out, then they can stop after the first 24 hours. First 24 hours, they need to wear this. But after that, then they can just wear it at night when they sleep. So um, that's for your acne prone people. Um, if they can avoid putting makeup on and just keeping this on, I recommend that more so. Uh, okay, so during the first five days following the treatment, avoid hot water. Of course, they're probably not going to want to put hot water on their skin anyways. It's going to feel horrible. Um, and, and swimming pools, you don't want chlorine uh, on their skin. Avoid abrasive and harsh products such as like um, retinols or salicylic acid. They shouldn't be using anything outside of the emollient anyways. Um, avoid any mechanical or thermal damage to the treatment area. Of course, like no getting in saunas because that can potentially create PIH, uh, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, which is very hard to treat. Um, avoid strenuous exercise. 
Now, if they're big into fitness and they're like, no, I cannot avoid exercise. I tell them, okay, that's fine. Just don't go kickboxing. Don't go, you know, um, doing spin class. You can still do some stuff. Like you can get out and walk and you can do yoga and, you know, Pilates after 24 hours. Just no, nothing strenuous. Um, and then, of course, keep this skin um, clean. Oh, and then I put that on here with a gentle skin cleanser such as Cetaphil. So that's a good one. Um, okay, and then it just walks them through here, which is nice, what to expect after the little small scabs and, um, you know, when they'll be gone. So it walks them through that, what we've already walked through. Um, and then avoid any type of skin tanning. Absolutely no tanning beds, no sun exposure. Um, if they're going to be outside in, in um, the days after, then after 24 hours, they can use a sunscreen and then the, um, then the, um, uh, uh, ah, sunscreen and then the emollient to protect their skin. If they're not going to be in the sun at all, then just avoid the sunscreen. Just put the emollient on. Um, okay, so if blistering occurs, of course, contact you guys, their physician. Um, and then during your entire treatment of, um, course of treatment, stay hydrated. Radio frequency is attracted to H2O. It's attracted to water. So the more hydrated their skin, the better the response is going to be. If they're severely dehydrated, they're going to get into an ablative response when you don't want to or if you didn't want to. Why? Because there's high resistance in the skin. They're also not going to get as good of a, of a treatment, as a, a good of a result. So drinking at least a liter of water before every treatment and throughout their full course. I recommend in a consultation talking to them about drinking a liter to a liter and a half of water, even two liters if they can, every day throughout their full course of treatment. So you really make sure that they're properly hydrated. Um, okay, and then use high factor SPF. We spoke about that. Sorry, someone just wrote a comment, so the little thing popped up. Oh, there we go. Now I can see. Um, and then avoid any type of skin tanning. Oh, it goes through that again. Okay, here's a big one. I added this on recently. If you have a breakout, avoid picking or squeezing the skin or lesion for at least one month, as this will result in petechiae. I did that myself, so I had to add this on here. I had a VFR treatment. A month or three weeks later, I had a breakout. So I went to, to squeeze my skin and I immediately petechiaed. It looked like you had just pulsed on the skin and it looked like the matrix marks were back. And that's a petechiae. So even though seven days later, they may not have the matrix marks, their skin is not healed. There's a lot going on much deeper that we cannot see. So they... They should not squeeze their skin as this is going to result in that petechiae, which is not good. And I was actually treating a friend of mine who had acne scars and she came back in for her uh, next treatment four weeks later and she had those petechiae marks. And I asked her, were you squeezing your skin? And she said, yeah. And that happened. And I said, it will. So just avoid any type of squeezing of the skin. And I put for at least one month, I mean, it should be really longer, um, but for at least one month you know, don't squeeze. Okay, I got a question here. So let's see. Would you advise using hydrocortisone based moisturizer? No, I wouldn't. I mean, listen, hydrocortisone is my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> um, and by the way, if you live in the States, uh, and you have a CVS pharmacy, they sell tiny little hydrocortisone packets, like tiny ones for um, like per treatment. So not the full bottle, but tiny packets, which are great. Um, I love hydrocortisone for after IPL. So I always put it on after skin rejuvenation. I always put it on after vascular and pigmentation treatments. And that's just to ensure that the heat is not going to keep getting hotter after the treatment. It's going to start calming the skin down. Um, so I always do that for safety. Um, but no, I wouldn't do it for the VFR. I mean, it, Listen, it's a topical steroid, so it does calm the skin. And if they are so hot and ice isn't cutting it, then it could, you know, help. But I just really recommend when you're done to just leave it be and just put that emollient on and just using ice packs 
But again, if it's so hot and they need that relief and they need that calming, um, and it's just purely hydrocortisone, uh, 1% like over the counter, something like that to calm the skin, then it's not the end of the world. It's not going to be horrible to the skin for sure. Um, but I just really like to leave it alone and just do the emollient if I can, because I just, the more products we put on the skin, the more we're going to get into a likely case of an adverse. And I just, with this handpiece, like to really just leave it very basic. All right, so now I'm going to go back to the workbook. So just give me one second. Okay, so I have to come out of here, close that out, pull that up. Voila. <laughs> okay, so we spoke about all the post-care. Now we'll talk about treatment scheduling and um, number of treatments, things like that. So number of treatments, uh, typically it's three to six. Um, it's something like acne scars, you're not going to sell them a package of three. You know, acne scars and scarring and stretch marks, those are much harder things to treat. Um, so you're going to need... I would more so sell them a package of six. Um, you know, if you're still not there after six, then it's okay to do one or two additional ones. After that, though, just leave the skin be for three to four months and then assess. Because if you do too much, we don't want to create too much damage to the skin. Um, if someone is just needing, you know, they're 45 and have fine lines and wrinkles and maybe just a small amount of laxity, then um, three treatments or three to four treatments is um, going to be great for them. Treatment interval is going to be one treatment every four to six weeks. So this is important. Make sure you're never treating before four weeks. We really need to give that healing time. But also make sure that you're not extending beyond six weeks because we also need efficacious treatments. So they can fall in between the four to six range, um, four to six week range. Maintenance is going to be one treatment every six to 12 months. So that's what's so great about this hand piece is that results are so phenomenal that a lot of times they don't need maintenance, but maybe once every year. Um, I'll take myself, for example, I had really bad acne scarring. I had really bad acne growing up. I was on Accutane twice in my life. Um, and, you know, I had scarring from it. So I did a series of these treatments. I think I did, um, I think I probably did six. And now I just maintain with doing one VFR a year. Well, I maintain more than that because anybody with acne scars, even though it may, you may look at my skin and go, you don't have any acne scars. It, somebody with acne scars, we're going to live with it for the rest of our lives. So it's never just truly gone. I can make the appearance of my skin look um, great with treatments, but if I just stopped and let it be, my skin's not going to look so great in a year from now. So I actually maintain in a different way where I do an IPL skin rejuvenation treatment monthly. I do microdermabrasion first, prep my skin, remove the dead skin cells. Then I go in with the IPL, the 580 filter, and I try to really stay on that every month. Um, additionally, I have really oily skin, and that's why I had acne. And um, the IPL regulates the sebaceous glands. So I have much smaller pores after I do skin rejuvenation. I'm not as oily. Um, and then every once a year, I make sure to do one VFR treatment just to really, you know, maintain. So monthly IPL, then one of those months, I just do VFR every year. All right, I just got a question. Let's see what we have here. Um, hi, Kara. Can you send us the amended post care document? Um, okay, so anybody needing this amended document? Um, I'm going to give you guys an email. So just email what you're needing to clinicalusa at vioramed.com. Again, that's clinicalusa at vioramed.com. Um, and then additionally, I'm trying to think. 
because this is an IRB study in the U.S., I, and it's not an FDA-approved handpiece yet here in the States, I don't think we have this on the customer portal. So I think, yeah, you will just need to email us, and we'll send it over to you. Um, and then additionally, Donna, our marketing manager, she's on here. Um, she always joins me on the webinars uh, to be my right hand. And um, we send out the recorded webinar when we're done here. So we may just be able to, yeah, we'll do that. We will, when we send out, or maybe she doesn't send out the recorded webinars now because we just upload them to, to the viewer online academy. So maybe what I can do is just have Maluni, um, who's in charge of all of our clinical emails that come in, send it out to everybody that was on the call. So maybe we can do that. So Donna, if you're on here, maybe you could just um, send a quick email to Maluni, having her send out that post-treatment care guideline um, to everyone. That would be wonderful. Okay, yep, she's on here. She just put okay. Um, and then Donna, when I hang up with you, I'll just make sure that this one is sent to you and Maluni so she can send it out to everyone. Um, the workbook should have been sent out already. Um, check your email because when we um, send out the emails for the actual events that we're holding, we, we attach the workbook. So that should be attached to that email. Um, if you don't see it or you didn't get one of those emails, then just you can email clinicalusa at viewermed.com and we can send that to you. Or we can just have the workbook attached with the post-treatment care guidelines. When we're done with this webinar, we'll send it out to everyone. That, that could work as well. Um, okay, let me see if I missed any questions here. I don't think I got them all. Okay. Uh, let's see if we missed anything here. Okay, so just a few um, few things I'll point out here that your darker skin types, just always keep in mind that you're going to use lower energy on them, skin type 4, 5, 6, um, Hispanic skin, Asian skin, African skin, Indian skin, as an example. Um, you'll always use lower energy than you would ever do on a skin type 1, 2, or 3, especially when you first start. Um, testing them for their first few treatments, getting to know their skin and their response, because they can respond very differently and have negative um, adverse events happen with them if you just go in there really aggressively. Um, keep in mind, too, that when you are treating area, bony areas like the eyes, the forehead, the jawline, that you'll want to decrease your energy as well, because if you don't, you're going to get into much higher ablation because it's bony. Um, also, they usually cannot stand a higher energy around the eyes or forehead anyway, so you'll want to take it down a bit. Um, if men have hair and they need treatments where the hair is, they're going to need to shave. Um, and then I talked about everything else on here. I talked about side effects that could happen. I spoke a lot about PIH, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, which your darker skin types are more susceptible to, so that's another reason why you want to be very safe on them. Spoke about that. Spoke about that. Okay, I think we pretty much um, covered it, which is great. I did it in two hours. Um, you know, we have contraindications with all of the hand pieces, so we incorporated like the consent form and contraindications to our practice development Skype. So if you haven't attended one of those yet, we are going to be holding one. Um, we just held one Tuesday. And it's recorded, so you can always go and watch the recorded uh, version of it. But if you want to be live, um, which I recommend anyways, we will do it not next week, but the following week. So um, if you need to like listen to the contraindications, consent forms, how you go about that with your patients, we will um, be doing that in two weeks. So just check the online academy um, website, which is Viora onlineacademy.com and you can see all the dates that are coming up and we want you to be on all of them so uh, definitely check those out the next one that we are doing is going to be the pristine which is our microdermabrasion um, I'm going to cover didactic and then I'm going to do a, a live demonstration of how you um, how you use it so that'll be a good one um, and then the one after that next week is going to be 
uh, live demonstration of the IPL, the ST, and the V form. Then the week after that is the practice development one I was talking about, keys to success for your business. And we're going to talk about things that you can do now um, for your business with you not being in your office. You guys are not, um, uh, you know, having all this downtime, but really keeping your business strong during this hard time. And then also keys of um, what you'll do when you actually get back to the office to be even stronger when you get, go back in. Um, and then the one after that is going to be the VFR hands-on. So I'll actually be doing the treatment, actually doing the hands-on. So you'll be able to see that. Um, okay. Just got a question. Let's see. Um, thanks, Kara. Greetings from Ireland. Oh, uh, Ireland was so informative as always. Thank you. Happy Easter. Thank you so, so much. Happy Easter and um, Passover, you guys. Um, and I can't tell you how much my heart is in Ireland. I just got back from Ireland. Um, what was it? Maybe four weeks ago, six weeks ago. It was my first time there. And oh my gosh, I, I spent... 10 days, rented a car by myself, learned how to drive on the other side of the road by myself in wind and hail and rain. <laughs> it was crazy. And I absolutely fell in love with your country. I drove and, and was able to see almost everything, stayed in a castle. Oh my gosh, my heart is probably, will always still be there because I was just so in love with it. Um... Thank you, Kara. The Sterling Club Las Vegas loves you. Oh my gosh, I haven't heard from you guys in so long. I'm so glad that um, you just wrote in. Uh, I would love to hear how things are going with you and um, and if you guys have gotten done with your remodeling and I uh, would love to see photos. I would love to come visit you guys. I'm so happy that you just wrote in. So when everything's up and going, um, just email me, and I would love to come visit you guys. Just see how, see how everything looks. Um, what do we got here? This is the time for you guys to write any questions. Um, thank you. This was great. Oh, you're so welcome. Hi, Kara. Would you explain why Botox or dermal filler within six months is a contraindication? Uh, um, it's just because of the really, really high heat temperatures. So with like ST, we don't, we're not reaching those really high heat temperatures. So it's not going to denature any of the filler or Botox in the area. Um, when you start getting into really high heat above 100 degrees Celsius, this is when we can start to denature even natural fillers. Um, if you're in the States, and you're doing the IRB study, they just can't be doing any Botox or filler anyways, just because that's part of the study. Um, so you just need to avoid it. But we could potentially get into those higher heat temperatures where we start to affect, um, you know, filler or Botox, which we don't want to do. Um, would you also elaborate on immune system disorder? Many patients have these. Um, it's overall healing. You know, when we create these um, controlled thermal injuries, are they, is their skin really able to properly heal? So something like um, liver disease, their, their healing response is affected. Um, somebody that has like HIV, um, their healing responses is, is affected. Lupus. And with lupus, we can create like a lupus flare, a butterfly rash on their face, which we, we don't want to do. Um, so it's just, you know, are they able to, to heal properly? That's the question. If you are the physician, the treating physician, and you want to treat um, like outside of Viora's guidelines, then, you know, just be very safe and do it in a very controlled way where you're really slowly testing. But if you're in the States and you're, you're part of the IRB study, you just can't treat anybody that is contraindicated anyways. Um, I explain all of this on that training video that I was speaking on, so we can send that over to you if you'd like, um, going through all the IRB documents and contraindications and why. Uh, so that's clinicalusa at viormed.com. Again, that's clinicalusa at viormed.com, so you can email for that tutorial video. Um, the lip plump is awesome. Oh, yay. I'm so glad that you love it. Uh, thank you. Happy Easter. You're so welcome, Doobie Mad. I love you, love you, love you, love you, love you. Um, they're one of our distributors and just adore them. 
Um, hi, Kara. Hi. <laughs> I think maybe they were going to write more. Um, okay, so I'm just going to wait just a second here. By the way, you guys can unmute yourselves and ask questions if you'd like. So I'll just wait a minute and see if you guys, anybody unmutes themselves to ask a question. Okay, I just got a question here. Um, hypo, oops, ah, hypothyroidism or hyper. Okay, so hyper or hypothyroid, those are also considered auto, uh, immune, autoimmune disorders. Correct. So again, going back to can they properly heal? Um, and additionally, um, just like overall, uh, it, so this is also a bigger one for like, think of like V-form. If they're gaining a lot of weight because it's, and, and if it's controlled, that's fine. It's if it's not controlled. So if they have hypo or hyper controlled, it's okay. Uncontrolled, it's not okay. Um, so, you know, just think of like weight gain and overall healing response uh, with immune uh, disorders, just making sure that it's, it's very controlled. And if you're not the person that's, that's um, um, prescribing their medications or checking their levels of their thyroid, then I highly recommend that you're always reaching out to their treating physician for their thyroid and making sure that they are at a controlled level. Um, Okay, hi, Kara. Can we get a list emailed of upcoming events as it's been great to quickly register for what's coming up? Um, Donna, are you emailing lists? So I'm going to give you two ways of knowing the events that are coming up, and then Donna can, can share if she's emailing them. Um, but if you, and by the way, we would love for all of you guys to follow our Instagram. So our Instagram and our Facebook is called Viora Med. So follow us there. You will see all of the upcoming events that we have on Viora Med. Like today at 6 p.m. Eastern New York time, uh, we're doing cocktails with Kara. So I will have a cocktail in hand and we're going to be interviewing one of our um, doctors on our new TMJ study and protocol that we have. So TMJ. Um, when they have like really sore jaw and issues with TMJ, we're going to be talking about the protocol, how it works. Um, so that's super exciting. So we're doing that today on Instagram Live. So make sure to follow Viora Med and you'll see that. Instagram Live, 6 p.m. New York time, Cocktails with Kara. Um, I'll be interviewing that doctor. So that's exciting. So you'll see everything that's coming up on Instagram and Facebook. And then additionally, you can um, check Viora vioraonlineacademy.com. You'll be able to register there as well. So that's really easy. Um, and then let's see what Donna said. Um, let's see. We have email. Oh, Maloney's on. Hi, honey. Um, so Maloney is so fantastic. She's the one that is behind the clinical emails. So you guys probably agree that she's very fantastic. Um, by the way, this is just for the United States, um, the clinical USA email. Uh, gosh, I can't talk anymore. Email. Um, so Maluni said she has emailed. So just check your email. Um, it's been great. Thank you very much. Greetings from Belgium. Oh my gosh, amazing. Oh, so many people from around the world are on here. This is great. And I would love to visit you one day. Um, so that's so wonderful. I would love to go to Belgium. Okay, we are sending out emails with the list for U.S. customers only since we only have access to U.S. database. Oh, right. So if you wrote that in and you were from overseas, um, then you would just want to go on to vioraonlineacademy.com or our Instagram or our Facebook to see all of the courses that are coming up in the near future. If you are in the US, then you would have been emailed. Um, okay, please send link to my email for next course. I needed to call New York office for Zoom link. Okay, um, but I mean, here's the thing. If you just go to vioraonlineacademy.com, you can just register right there. The, it's, you can register and you should be getting a link for it. If I'm missing something, Donna, then you can just write me or write everybody here. 
Um, okay, hey Kara, can we use it in active cases of rubra or alba, which are commonly seen in gym person? Got a question from a user in India. Oh, okay. So like the stretch marks that they get when <laughs> my ex-boyfriend had that. He was big into the gym, so he had big muscles. And then, you know, of course, you get the stretch, um, stretch marks from, from usually men, it's here, from being stretched out, like their biceps. This all gets stretched. Um, yeah, absolutely, you can use it. So you would want to do deep um, and then ablation and coagulation, so putting that pulseration right in the middle. Um, I did register but didn't receive link. Oh, okay, weird. I wonder what's going on there then. Um, Donna, if you know, if they registered but didn't receive a link, is there anything that they could do in that case? And um, Cynthia, make sure you check like your spam and junk mail too, as it could come there. Um, but if you, oh, okay, <laughs> I did. I was going to say, but if you did check those, I'm not sure what's going on there. So. Um, Donna, any any recommendations if they register but the link doesn't come to them, what they could do? I'll just wait a second for her to write in. Someone's writing on the screen. Thanks for the polka dots. Um, usually when people register, the email is sent. Okay. Um, so Cynthia, if you have issues in the, in the future for, for this, if you're not receiving, um, viewers emails, or if you're not receiving a link, um, use the, um, the marketing email cause it goes straight to Donna so she can help you. And that's marketing dot usa at vioramed.com again that's marketing dot usa at vioramed.com so email her and you know instead of having a call so email her she'll get you the link um and then additionally oh um also maluni sends out separate links through okay so then also check if you're getting emails from clinical usa at vioramed.com because you should be getting um, links in two different ways. If you're still not, then just email um, marketing and Donna will make sure to get that to you. Um, you can even email clinicalusa at viewermed.com because Maluni will make sure to get that to you as well. Okay, thank you. Oh yeah, you're so welcome. Um, I'll just wait one more minute, see if anybody writes another question or unmutes themselves to ask a question. All right, getting quiet. All right, you guys, so we'll sign off then. Uh, thank you guys so, so much for joining us and um, especially around the world, you guys. I know there's a huge time difference. So thank you for staying up with us um, late to, to learn all these things. Um, and then of course our US customers too, we love you. Uh, we really wanna continue supporting you guys. So we're gonna continue doing these webinars. We're gonna mix it up and do different types um, of webinars. So just definitely keep uh, looking on at the, um, at the website, see everything that's coming up. Uh, we would love to see you guys today on Instagram Live, 6 p.m. Eastern, which is New York time, Cocktails with Kara, to learn that new TMJ protocol that we have. Um, it uses hand pieces that you guys already have, so you'll be able to really just offer them something um, separately outside of the cosmetic world to really help medically treat their TMJ and the issues that they may have. So we would love for you guys to join us um, on there to, to learn about that. Um, and I think that's it. We we love you. You are part of our family. So we're always gonna um to we're always gonna be here for you. Um all right, so stay safe, stay healthy, please. Um, and then 
stay indoors because we have to. <laughs> and um, we'll see you guys later today if you're able to join on Instagram. If not, I will see you guys next week. So happy Easter and also happy Passover. Okay. Bye, you guys.